train. What's up? Train wreck, we're in trouble. <clears throat> was, was Jim Martin the guy who was at dinner? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're live. Not yet. Not yet. Or yet. Still not. Good evening. This is Senator Dean Heller. I'm in my office here in uh, Washington, D.C. I want to welcome you to our Teletown Hall meeting. Um, this evening we're out in the rural portions of the state. Looking forward to this discussion. Um, we'll talk about things that are going on in Washington, D.C. in the next hour or anything that's going on in your community. Happy to talk about it. Obviously, there's a lot going on here in Washington, D.C. between uh, uh, jobs in the economy, health care, immigration reform, foreign policy has obviously come to the forefront. Any questions that you may have on any topic that you want to talk about, hit zero on your keypad. If you put zero on your keypad, that puts you in a queue, and we're going to get to as many questions as we possibly can uh, in the next hour. So hit zero on your keypad, we'll put you in a queue, and uh, we'll get to your questions. A lot going on, obviously. Uh, the, Iran, uh, uh, the Iraq situation uh, certainly is uh, deteriorating. Um, uh, a lot of questions as to whether what direction that's going to go. Uh, jobs in the economy, we're going to have a, uh, a question here. We'll, uh, uh, we'll do some uh, polling, see how you feel about the direction of the economy, um, and we can talk about other things. Obviously, we have the immigration problems uh, with the Texas border uh, and uh, what's going on in Arizona. Uh, those are tough situations. Hit zero on your keypad. And we'll talk about any of these issues that you want to discuss. It's a, real, it's a great opportunity. I enjoy it. It gives me an opportunity to talk to my constituents. I do it every week. Um, and I do it uh, uh, for the very purpose, of course, of staying close with my constituents uh, throughout the state. So why don't we go to our first caller um, and talk to Lisa uh, in Eureka. Uh, I, I, yeah, in Eureka. Lisa? Uh, yes, this is. Keith and Lisa Haney in Eureka. Yes. Is Go ahead, Steve. Steve. Keller? Yes, it is. Go ahead, Steve. Keith. 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 I'm yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, um, I just wondered. Um, we just jumped in on this, and we were curious about what you're doing with the um, the public lands issue in Nevada, and uh, what's going on in northern Nevada, as as far as uh, um, you know the the Clive and Bundy or whatever situation down in nor in southern Nevada. That's really not a poster child that we want to represent us. So I was just curious uh, what your position is on uh, what's going on with the uh, Bureau of Land Management up here. Okay, okay, I'm happy to do that. Uh, and Keith, I'm probably gonna have to hang up on you because we are getting some uh, feedback. Uh, uh, from your phone, uh, but Keith's asking about uh, public lands issues that we have in uh, rural Nevada. Uh, Keith's calling out of Eureka. Um, as most of you may be aware of, the federal government, between BLM Forest Service and uh, Fish and Wildlife, own about 85% of the uh, lands in the state of Nevada, and, and I'm one who believes that the federal government owns just too much of the federal land. Landlocks are small towns, makes it difficult to grow. It even landlocks uh, portions of Las Vegas, so it makes it difficult for them to grow. Um, so anyway, too many restrictions. Um, and like I said, particularly in our rural uh, portions of it. Uh, one of my top priorities here in Congress is to fight for multiple use on our public lands. Additionally, um, I've introduced and enacted a variety of bills that sell or trade land back to our communities. I'm one who believes that uh, the individual will take much better care than the government will of, uh, of, of, of lands. Um, and uh, there's a uh, committee that's out there now studying our public uh, lands and uh, trying to determine whether or not the state of Nevada would be better off uh, um, managing uh, this property. And I believe that that is the case, and we'll see what this uh, We'll see what this report has to say. One of the big issues, one of the big issues that's going to be facing us, not only the state of Nevada, but 10 other western states, and that's uh, whether or not the, uh, there, there's a listing um, of, the, uh, uh, of the sage grouse. As you know, that was the, uh, the uh, issue uh, in southern Nevada with the uh, showdown they had down there was uh, cattle versus uh, 
desert tortoises, and I think we're going to see similar problems in northern Nevada when we start talking about sage grouse. If that gets listed as an endangered species, they're going to be saying the same thing, that cows and, uh, and uh, sage hen, even though they've lived together for you know, hundreds of years, all of a sudden they can't be on the same piece of property. So it's going to cause some real consternation. But bottom line is this. I think that the uh, federal government owns too much of the state. I'll give you an example. In 1864, when we became a state, it was the same year that Nebraska became a state. Today, the federal government owns 5% of Nebraska, yet owns 85% of the state of Nevada. It needs to change does need to change, and that will always be the direction that I move to make sure that uh, we have access um, of these public lands for mining, uh, for agriculture, uh, for sheep and cattle, and to make sure that you can make a living in the rural, rural portions of the state. Uh, Keith, th thanks for the call. Thanks for calling out in Eureka. This is Senator Dean Heller. I'm in my office here in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining me. We have quite a few of you um, on the line today, and I, and I do appreciate that. This is our opportunity to talk about issues. And obviously, public lands was the first question that was raised. If you want to participate, um, you can call, or uh, excuse me, you can hit zero on your keypad, and uh, that will put you in the queue, and we'll get to questions as we go throughout this evening. If you're uncomfortable um, uh, raising the question publicly, you can call my office in Reno. Uh, my office number there is 686-5770. That's 775-686-5770. Give my staff or office a call with any questions or comments that you may have. We uh, look uh, forward to those questions. So anyway, thank you. Thanks for joining me this evening. Again, hit zero on your keypad, and we'll get as many of you in the queue as possible and get as many answers uh, in the next hour. So let's go out to Ely. We went from Eureka. Let's go out to Ely and talk to uh, Laura Lee. Laura Lee? Hey, this is Charlie Brown, Laura's husband. Yes. I think that hurt in America is the Environmental Protection Agency. We don't need them. We have the cleanest country in the world. And the land issues are another big one. In 1864, the Constitution of Nevada says that if we would join the United States, we would have the land back after the Civil War. It's never happened. Okay, we may have lost. You get that. What? Okay, I think we might have lost you. Um, go ahead quickly, quickly, and ask, ask your question again. We've got a bad connection, and it may be the problem on our side. I say the Environmental Protection Agency is ruining America. Totally. Being a businessman, being a rancher, they don't know what they're doing, and and the sage grass listing sucks because it isn't it's water issues for the sage grouse not habitat that's a multitude of questions but nevertheless uh, 1864 the constitution said that if we would join the united states they would give the ground back after the civil war it's never happened okay okay and any of that? thanks thanks for your question sorry that uh we just have a bad connection, but I, uh, I think I got the gist of your question. It has to do with the EPA and uh, your concerns about the impact uh, the EPA has um, here in this country and what it's doing uh, to our ability to, uh, to uh, run small businesses and uh, the economy as a whole. As you're probably aware of, the EPA just uh, recently announced a new regulation uh, to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 30% uh, by the year 2030. Um, and so obviously it requires every state to meet, meet these uh, emission standards um, by, uh, by implementing uh, uh, certain upgrades. Uh, for example, closing uh, fossil fuel power plants, uh, improving efficiency, and, and or promoting uh, renewable energy. I think at a time uh, when the energy costs remain far too high, our nation needs what I consider to be an all-of-the-above approach to energy development and concerned about this administration's aggressive regulatory overreach. So I think the gentleman, I couldn't catch your name because of the static, but uh, I, I, uh, I share your concerns about the direction of this country and the ability of this economy, the ability of this economy to move forward. This is what I want to do. Since the last question was asked about uh, talking about the economy, um, I want to do a survey. I do these surveys uh, every week to get your feelings on particular questions. And the survey today um, is about um, the economy. 
and I want everybody, as, po as many people as possible, to participate in this survey, and you can do so by pushing one, two, or three on your keypad on your phone. So let me uh, ask the question first, and then you'll recognize uh, one for yes, two for no, and three if you're undecided, but obviously the economy is the uh, topic of discussion has been for the last five or six years. However, there are 20 million Americans that are currently unemployed, regardless of the fact that the president often talks about how well the economy is improving. In fact, three or four years ago, said that it was the, uh, the, the it was the summer of uh, of, uh, uh, re of of return where um, we had uh, uh, an economic uh, uh, upturn, and and they believe that uh, as you hear from the president that the economy is improving. Yet we still have 20 million Americans that are unemployed. Uh, real unemployment, about 12%. I think the unemployment in Nevada uh, remains one of the highest in the nation at 8%, and the real unemployment is probably somewhere around 15%. So here's the question. Here's the question. Uh, on your keypad, one for yes, two for no. Do you feel like the economy is turning around? One for yes, two for no, and three if you're undecided. Do you feel like the economy is turning around? On your keypad, press one for yes, two for no, and three if you're undecided. And if you're on the phone, please participate. I assure you that this information that I get, um, I use. I use it in hearings. I use it on the floor. I use it when I talk to my colleagues uh, in the Senate about how people in Nevada feel about these particular issues. And today, of course, is about the economy. Do you feel like the economy is turning around? Press one for yes, two for no, and three if you're undecided. And we'll go on to some more questions. I will ask this survey question more than once tonight, just so we make sure that we get everybody uh, an opportunity to participate. But let's go to Heather. Let's go to Heather and McGill. Heather? Hello. Hi, Heather. Oh, hi, Senator Heller. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Good. Hey, my question is about medical marijuana in Nevada. It is almost unable to get it. Why can we not open dispensaries in rural Nevada? Um, I didn't uh, realize, uh, Heather, that it was limited, um, that you didn't have access to it. I know that there's an approval process. I'm not that aware of it. Uh, but I do know that there's an application process by which it can be, uh, uh, by which it can be gained. Not knowing the rules or the regulations of it, probably the best thing to do is to call my office um, at 686-5770. That office number is 775-686-5770. And, uh, I, you know, you, you kind of stumped me a little bit on this one, and maybe there's more information that we'll have available to you. So, obviously, it's state law, um, not federal law, so that's probably why I'm a little less uh, uh, um, with, with that, without an understanding of it. But uh, call my office. Uh, we'll get the information that you need. Um, and again, that number is 686-5770. As everybody, uh, most on the phone line know that this was a ballot question a number of years ago that allowed for a dispensing of uh, marijuana for uh, medical purposes. So it is uh, in, uh, in state law. So anyway, we'll get to that, Heather. Call me. Again, 686-5770. We'll get to you. Let's go back uh, out to Eureka and talk to Dorothy. Dorothy and Eureka? Hello? Hi. Hi, this is Randy. Hi, Randy. Um, Senator, I, I share the concern the gentleman had with the EPA. Um, you know, if we look at the world and from a global perspective, the reduction of the burning of coal, that's just being moved to China or India. They're burning the coal, and there's no pollution control whatsoever. So on a global basis, we're losing jobs we're losing the economy. What can we do to stop the EPA from doing this? It truly is going to destroy our nation. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, the, uh, you know, the concern that we have, and obviously a bigger concern is in some of the coal states, uh, states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. A lot of those areas are very concerned because it, it does create quite a few jobs. Um, what I'm looking for and what what I continue to advocate for is a very balanced uh, approach on this, uh, a all-of-the-above approach. I know there's some real advantage to the state of Nevada to push uh, alternative energy. Geothermal is huge in northern Nevada and throughout rural northern Nevada. In fact, it's uh, 
probably uh, better in, uh, in, in Nevada than any other state. We have solar energy, we have wind energy, and so Nevada can really, uh, can really uh, capitalize on, on this alter ter ter alternative source. But you've got to keep in mind that 40% of the electricity that's produced in this country, 40% is uh, produced by coal. And uh, if we're going to move in this direction of alternative energy, which I support, um, it's not going to happen overnight. And that's what I'm concerned about is losing the jobs and, try and slowing this economy down. So I, I, I will tell you one of the things that I did because of the concern of this caller and previous callers is uh, I've introduced the Energy Consumer Relief Act. And uh, basically what that bill does is rein in the EPA. What I would really like to see is uh, sort of more, more local control uh, and state control over some of the decisions that are made in these states. And I would much rather have uh, Governor Sandoval make some of these decisions than, uh, than perhaps some uh, bureaucrat here in Washington, D.C., trying to determine what's best for the state of Nevada. So I'll continue with this legislation. Um, I'll continue to push it. I think it's good for the states, uh, all the states, including the state of Nevada, so you know what, uh, what I'm working on. Thanks for the question. Uh, I want to go out to Crystal uh, in, uh, in Nye County and talk to Daniel. Daniel and Crystal? Hi there, Mr. L. Are you there? I sure am. Well, I have a, just a couple of, I'll, I'll quickly tell you where my head's at right now, okay? One's on the 12 cents that they want to place on every gallon of gasoline. The other is, as you know, the immigration's back with us again. They're coming in from Central America. That's an issue. And my other issue would be the Second Amendment. Are we, are we still solvent with the Second Amendment? Could you address those for me, please? All right, all right. Um... The gasoline tax, you started out with a 12 cents gasoline tax. I think that was introduced by Corker um, and a senator from Connecticut, I believe, were the two uh, sponsors of this particular piece of legislation. What we have is a highway bill that's, uh, that needs reauthorization. And I believe we need highway bills. I think we need highway funding. Um, and, uh, but I don't think we need to do it by raising taxes. Um, right now we have a real international problem. Um, as most of you are aware of, uh, uh, what you see on TV and, and our a lack of a, a, a real foreign uh, uh, discussion on what to do uh, with what's going on with ISIS and these, these uh, militants uh, uh, coming into Iraq. That being the case, um, they just uh, overtook their largest um, um, oil um, uh, service, uh, oil area uh, in that country, and obviously the concern is with the price of what will be the price of oil in the near future. While we're discussing uh, um, all this, uh, we've had proposals by senators uh, coming in to raise the gasoline tax by 12 cents. Maybe what I ought to do is survey that, that particular issue uh, and see how people feel, but uh, I won't be able to do that tonight. But uh, I would have a feeling that if I surveyed people about increasing their gasoline tax by 12 cents a gallon, that it wouldn't be very popular. But I assure you this, uh, that uh, I have not talked to the sponsors of this legislation. I'm just guessing they're trying to raise money to uh, build more highways and roads. I think there's a better way of doing that. Um, if uh, the, some of the funding isn't there, maybe we won't be able to in the next uh, recent cycle to put that kind of uh, money into it. Uh, you're, you talked about the Second Amendment. A little bit about the Second Amendment. Um, I can assure you that uh, I support, in fact, I was asked by the press yesterday about my feelings I, and uh, about the uh, Supreme Court and their decision on, uh, on uh, straw purchases of guns and handguns where an individual will go into a gun store and buy a, purchase a, a, a handgun and then sell it for the purpose of, of selling it to somebody else. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll watch this closely. My big concern is is to make sure that law-abiding citizens, you know, aren't affected. And I would hope this, that there would be uh, um, a, a caveat in that particular law that would allow, you know, a father or a parent to buy a, a gun for their children, uh, their son or sons or daughters, um, under certain circumstances. But uh, we'll see. We'll see if there's uh, any... Uh, any choice and opportunity for that to happen. But you can count on me supporting your Second Amendment 
um, rights and uh, and making sure that uh, we do try to keep hands uh, guns out of the hands of those that uh, that shouldn't have them, especially those that uh, perhaps have had court problems in the past or perhaps uh, uh, the the uh, those that have mental issues that uh, shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be handling guns. So anyway, those are the issues that I think we ought to be discussing here in Washington D.C. I'm eager to discuss those things, but first and foremost. Um, I do support the Second Amendment and want to make sure that uh, your rights uh, are upheld um, as as a citizen. Anyway, thank you. Um, thanks for the call. I certainly appreciate uh, you taking a few minutes. It's sure good to talk to you. Let's go to let's go to Fallon. Let's go to Fallon and talk to Rosalie. Rosalie. You want to talk to you? You want to talk to you? I'll talk to anybody who's on the phone. Yes, sir. Yes. How are you? Yeah. This is Frank. Uh, I'm Rosalie's husband. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I was wondering uh, what that gentleman said about 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 uh, the uh, illegal immigrants all infiltrating into this country. What are they going to do? Make this a third world country, or or are we supporting all them people that are coming over here? Or our taxpayers. I'm a disabled veteran, and and I live off the taxpayers too, which I'm not really proud of. But I'm proud of being fought for my country in Korea, in Korea and Vietnam. Okay. And okay. and all these people are coming over here now. Now I understand that they're getting better benefits uh, through 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 their their Medicaid than the veterans are getting for their for their care. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, let me talk about immigration for just a little bit because that is something the previous caller did bring up and I failed to answer. Um, obviously, like most of you, I'm aware of the increase of unaccompanied children along the southern border. Now, keep in mind, most of these children are coming from Central and South America as opposed to Mexico. But I am ex- uh, extremely concerned, uh, really concerned about the risk it, po- it poses. Uh, in both creating a humanitarian crisis and uh, obviously the security of our nation's border. So to me, to me, only reinforces why Congress needs to pass and should pass a comprehensive immigration reform legislation so that we can secure the nation's border. Let me tell you what was in that piece of legislation. Um, For border security, uh, this legislation doubles the number of Border Patrol agents um, at the southern border. The uh, comprehensive immigration reform legislation doubles the fencing at the border by requiring 700 miles more of total fencing, and the comprehensive immigration reform legislation requires businesses to have a working electronic employment verification system or an e-verify system so that they know who they are hiring um, in their businesses. I think that's important, and uh, I, I, I think that the issues and the problems that we're seeing today um, have uh, legs in the fact that uh, without the passage of this comprehensive immigration reform bill that was a border first bill um, is what's uh, um, at issue in securing our borders. So I'll tell you that my staff and I have been in contact with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Defense Department, uh, U.S. Department of Homeland Security on this issue and obviously look forward to getting additional um, additional answers as we move along. It's a huge humanitarian problem, humanitarian problem that we have here in this country today and we need to uh, really uh, 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 take a look at this and see what we can do to solve the problem as quickly as we possibly can. Um, obviously, it's an issue in Texas, uh, a big issue in Arizona, and those states uh, are telling us how, how difficult it is, and I've been in contact with all of them. So anyway, thank you for your service to this country. Appreciate uh, all veterans that are with us this evening, and thank you uh, for all your hard work and what you've done to uh, keep this nation safe and secure at this point. So thank you. I want to uh, go to uh, Baker. Let's go to Baker and... Uh, and talk to uh, talk to Barbara, Barbara and Baker. Hi, this is Dean Baker rather than Barbara. Barbara's my wife, but Dean Hi, Baker, Dean. I think you know. I know Dean. How well, are I'm you? Really, well, I'm just old and dumb. But what I'm really curious about is why my history of working with the BLM is so different today than it is 
when I was a kid in World War II and my father was working with the BLM and then I worked with my father and the BLM through the clear through the 50s and to the 60s and I thought they were a wonderful help to us on the ranch and things and they taught us more how to do things and set things up and got things water coming up and whatnot and now I still know that there are many wonderful BLM people, but they're being forced to do something vastly different out of Washington, D.C., and the powers there. And I know that Harry Reid, in his book several 20 years ago or so, said how good it was to get wildlife or cattle off of the range in Clark County. And I know that he has told me, Dean, you shouldn't be raising hay and farming. That water needs to go to the city, and I'm 300 miles from there. But anyway, why is there so much difference in the attitude? And I've known Harry Reid a lot of years, and I, I, I think that he isn't really happy to have cattle on the range land. But it used to be that BLM and even some of the retired BLM people are mad that they're what they're had to do is different. Anyway, my anyway. question is, what do you think about that? All right, Dean. Um, a little bit of history. Dean uh, Baker has been a a real fighter out there in uh, on the eastern side of the state, uh, and has pushed back. Um, and something that I admire, pushed back against the BLM and for service and, and attempts to uh, take a lot of water and, and remove it off of his property and send it to different parts of the state. Um, a lot of ranchers um, took the money and ran, uh, but Dean wasn't willing to do that, stood up for what he thought was right, and I've had Dean in my office here in Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, proud to call him a Nevada. Great guy, um, and uh, works hard for all of us, but he's you know, he's touched on a, on a chord. Um, Obviously, this issue has caused problems in the southern end of the state, uh, uh, a situation that I hated to see uh, when the, with the standoff between uh, um, some ranchers down in southern Nevada and BLM. And there, there's just something wrong, I, I, I would have to say, something wrong when uh, BLM comes in with, uh, you know, with their uh, attitudes and uh, kicking uh, ranchers off the ground. Now, now let, me, let, let me be clear that both sides were wrong in this particular um, issue on this issue, but I just had real problems with BLM coming in and shooting someone's cows because they uh, shouldn't have been on the property. And uh, anyway, uh, fortunately, there was no uh, uh, there was nobody hurt or there were no huge accidents uh, that occurred in that uh, situation. But you know, this is something we're living with lately. Um, I think uh, if they list the sage grouse, you're going to see similar confrontations in the uh, in other portions of the state where. Uh, um, uh, BLM comes in, and, and I guess I do question why they have so much uh, police authority. Uh, I'm one who believes that if you want to fix a situation or calm down a situation uh, or a confrontation, you ought to bring in the sheriff's department, uh, local sheriff's department, because they're trained in order to uh, solve most of those problems. But, boy, it's getting more aggressive and more aggressive uh, by some, and Dean said some, and I agree with him. There are some good BLM uh, employees out there, but some are very, very aggressive, and uh, I hate to see it. I think most of the calls now, I think at one point most of the calls came out of the state of Nevada. We had a BLM director uh, with a good head on his or her shoulders. Now we're getting most of the calls uh, for what to do coming out of Washington, D.C., and uh, frankly, we have members of Congress and the senators that uh, believe they know what's best uh, for states out west uh, here uh, here in Washington, D.C. And one of the things you have to be aware of, there's a big difference uh, between what goes on on the East Coast, uh, say east of the Mississippi, and what's happening west of the Mississippi. Most uh, East Coast uh, uh, senators and members of Congress have no idea, no idea what we're dealing with out west. They can't comprehend the fact that the federal government owns 85% of the land. And you know, they don't really seem to care, and, and I think that's a shame. We have some good legislators back here pushing back pretty hard. Uh, myself, uh, Senator Barrasso from Wyoming, uh, Rish from Idaho, um, Enzi from Wyoming. It's good to see members, uh, Mike Lee from Utah, really pushing back and trying to educate, educate uh, senators uh, 
and members of the House on the East Coast to let them know how difficult it is for us to earn a living um, on these lands uh, on the, in the western portions of the state. Here's my fear, and I think Dean shares this. Fear is, is that uh, they will uh, broaden their controls. The 85% isn't enough. They're going to want more. They're going to do that by listing the sage grouse. They want another 18 million acres of uh, habitat just for sage grouse. Trying, uh, trying to figure out how to solve that problem. And I will tell you, I'm trying to figure out how to solve that with, uh, with Senator Reid at this point. And I know for some people that's not very popular, but if we're going to get something done, if we're going to um, slow down or at least uh, avoid the listing of the sage grouse, our delegation is going to have to work together in order for that to happen. Anyway, I hope I, I gave you some background and, and the difficulties and, and the aggressiveness that we're now seeing uh, of the BLM Forest Service and uh, the Fish and Wildlife. Uh, unfortunately, these bureaucrats believe it's now their property. Let me just share one thing in closing, and that is these aren't public lands. These aren't public lands. They say that 85% of, the, uh, of, of Nevada is public lands. It's not. It's, uh, it's government lands, and the government thinks they own it. The BLM thinks they own their property. Um, and they don't want you on it. Um, Forest Service uh, thinks they own this land and that they don't want you on it. And it's making it difficult for ranchers, making it difficult for sheep herders, making it difficult for uh, mining. Um, and so some of us here in Washington, D.C. have been very vocal in trying to push it back. Hey, Dean, uh, thanks for the call. Always good to talk to you. And I want to thank everybody again who's with us on this Teletown Hall meeting. Uh, this is Senator Dean Heller. I do this uh, weekly uh, out of my office here in Washington, D.C. What I'd like to do is go back to this survey question that I asked earlier and uh, talk about the economy. The president often talks about how the economy is improving. And yet, uh, if you look uh, um, a little closer, 20 million Americans are currently unemployed or underemployed, uh, which means real unemployment in this country is somewhere around 12%. Meanwhile, the unemployment in Nevada remains one of the highest in the country at 8%. Our real unemployment, meaning those that are underemployed um, or those who have quit looking for work, is somewhere around 15%. So the survey question for today, and you can use your, your phone in front of you to answer the question, is do you feel like the economy is turning around? On your phone, press 1 for yes, 2 for no, and three if you're undecided. Again, the question, the survey question for today, do you feel like the economy is turning around? Press one for yes, two for no, and three if you're undecided. And that encourages as many people possible to participate uh, because I do use this information in the speeches that I give on the Senate floor and my discussions with other uh, with other colleagues. So thank you. And talking a little bit about the uh, the economy, I think uh, we ought to be fair in uh, in the assessment of what's going on out there. Um, uh, a lot of polling going on. Gallup had been came out recently and said that uh, you know the average income. The average middle-class household income in this country in the last five years is now down $3,500 a year. Um, the average increase uh, for health care in this country for the middle-class family has increased $2,500. Um, there are nearly 20 million that are unemployed. Half of the graduates uh, from our universities are now moving back in with mom and dad. Um, and... And women in this country, there are now 3.7 million more in the last five years, 3.7 million more women that are now in poverty. Um, so it's hard to, to, to make the argument, as this president often does, is about how this economy is improving with statistics like that. Anyway, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, let's go to Lovelock and talk to Steve. Steve out in Lovelock? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Okay. My question on, on this uh, immigration reform crap, um, I, I see uh, the path to citizenship, um, allowing the illegals to stay. Um, most of us have real heartburn with any increase of, of the influx uh, per year, you know, uh, allowing so many per year to come into the country and allowing the illegals to stay, we have over, like you said, we've got over 20 million unemployed um, that could be employed if we simply got rid of the illegals. And uh, I see you're a supporter of that particular bill, and I'd like to know, you know what your idea on that was. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, 
I would make this argument. Um, we have quite a few people here on the phone right now listening to us, and I would make this argument that unless you like the current system and where we are today, and that's uh, 11 or 12 million people that are here in this country, um, and they're not here legally, that most everybody here on this phone is for some type, some type of reform, uh, some type of immigration reform, and we need to support and push forward on immigration reform. And first and foremost, it must be tough. It has to be tough on the border security. Um, and I think this was a, a border security first piece of legislation. Let me let me tell you how tough it is. If this uh, comprehensive immigration reform system were to pass, that we passed out of the United States Senate, you'd have a border security guard every thousand feet on the on the border. Every thousand feet, you would have border security. We have a system that's broken. Let's be honest, and I think everybody knows that this system is broken, and there has to be an earned citizenship. It's going to be tough, uh, you know, to uh, to deport 12, 11, 12 million people um, that are in this country right now, and that's of course is whether or not you could find the 10 or 12 million. But the the goal of the immigration reform was to make it an earned um, uh, an earned uh, citizenship that it, and make it tough. Uh, in other words, a process that takes 10, 11, 12 years in order to get through and put them in the back of the line. In other words, they have to pay certain fees, have to pay some taxes, pay some fines, um, and there are other certain criteria that would allow them to become uh, citizens here in this country. I think it was the right approach. That doesn't mean it can't be made better. That doesn't mean the House of Representatives couldn't take a look at it and make the legislation better. But it was a good first step. So that's what I'm looking for, Steve. That's why I support the legislation. It had to be uh, it had to be border security first, and then a real tough earned citizenship process uh, in order to uh, stay here um, in this country. And it really truly wasn't an amnesty bill. In fact, it'll be more difficult if you live in the country in order to get your citizenship than if you are starting the process today outside the country. So that's my feeling. I do believe, I do believe at, at every end of the spectrum of this economy, from intellectuals to to agricultural workers, um, that it did and would um, move this economy forward and would create jobs. And that's what we need in this country. We need a, a, a jobs bill, and I think this moved that in the right direction. Hope that helps answer your question. I know it doesn't make everybody happy, but we do need to solve this problem. I don't think anybody is happy with the current system that is broken. I think everybody is for immigration reform. The problem is everybody has a different idea. We're trying to put those ideas together back here in Washington, D.C. Steve, thanks for the call. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, being on the phone with us. And I want to go out to Fallon. Let's go to Fallon and talk to Olivia. Olivia? Good afternoon. How are you? I guess it's evening back there. It is. A little bit later. A little bit later. Um, what I want to know, just quickly, why are we not enforcing the immigration laws we have on the books? Everybody keeps talking, including yourself, about new legislation and <sighs> reform. Let's take care of what we've got. That. As far as people the coming in here illegally and having children that becomes their anchor babies, that was put in for the Negro population that were brought here against their will a hundred and some years ago. And that was to allow them to become citizens. Why doesn't somebody, if you really want to reform, get rid of that stipulation of the anchor babies and stop, enforce the legislation that is on the books now. I think we are way, way too lenient, and everybody talks about doing something new. Let's use what we've already got. Can you tell me why we are not doing that and why someone hasn't tried to get rid of an unpopular law? Okay, okay. Um, trust me that that discussion has been had back here in Washington, D.C., and frankly, it's in the Constitution. It would take a constitutional amendment in order to change that. Um, and that's why it hasn't been addressed. Uh, um, it'd be so difficult, I think, to, to move forward with a constitutional amendment. What we're trying to do is solve the, solve the issue a lot quicker. The process of a constitutional amendment would take years and years and years in order for that to occur. So that's what this compre uh, comprehensive immigration reform uh, was to address and try and to solve some of the problems 
um, immediately. And one of the things that it does solve, and one of the things the current laws does not solve, and that's border security. Um, and that's why you saw so much tightened up. In fact, I was involved um, in the negotiation process of this and did increase the funding that was necessary for more border security. We talked about 700 miles more of fence. We talked about a thousand, every thousand feet have a border security agent. We don't have that today. Um, and there's no law in the book today that would require it unless you pass this immigration reform. So again, it doubles the number of, of uh, border patrol agents and it doubles the fencing at the border uh, with a required 700 miles of total fence. Doing things that progressively, I think, would increase, strengthen our laws that we have that are currently on the books, making it better and uh, allowing a earned in, uh, citizenship uh, for those that are already here in the country. Sure appreciate uh, your uh, your question, and thanks for, uh, for taking time, Olivia, and thanks for your question. I want to go out to Mina. Uh, we're going to go out to Mineral County, Mina, and talk to Tom. Tom, are you with us? Tom? All right, we'll try the next one. Let's go to Winnemucca. Let's go to Winnemucca and talk to Kathy. Kathy in Winnemucca? Uh, good evening, Senator. Hi. Um, I, I wanted, hey, I wanted to ask you about the president's use of executive orders to govern rather than going through uh, the Congress, and he seems to be bypassing the uh, order of governance, and increasingly so. What uh, can be done about that, and what are your thoughts on that? I think you make a good point, um, and I'm hearing that more and more around, uh, around the state as Obama continues to uh, overreach. Uh, executive orders, uh, believing that all he needs is a pen and a telephone, and he can uh, make and produce any law that he wants here in the country. And that's frustrating, frustrating for some of us that, frankly, uh, believe it all should be done through legislation. Um, and I agree with you. I think the president too often bypasses Congress uh, with his executive orders, orders, and, frankly, with it comes burdensome regulations. Um, that's why. That's why there's a piece of legislation in here called uh, the RAINS Act, um, R-E-I-N-S, the RAINS Act, and I've uh, consistently supported it while I was here in Washington, D.C. It would require that Congress approve every new major rule proposed by the executive agency before it can be enforced on the American people. So what it does, new law requires the federal government, uh, the administration, that any new change, new regulation, major new regulation, has to be approved um, by the Congress. And I think that's uh, common sense. Laws are made. Laws are made by Congress. Uh, if you took, uh, if you took uh, history uh, and uh, uh, government 101, if you took government 101, you know the, that the uh, branch of government that makes the laws um, is the Congress, and the purpose of the administration is to enforce the laws, not make new laws, but enforce the laws um, that have been proposed by the Congress. So uh, it's a real, uh, I think, violation of the intent uh, of our founding fathers, the intent of our, our Constitution, and that is to have this administration bypass uh, Congress with these executive orders. So I'll keep pushing on this RAINS Act uh, and uh, agree with you in the meantime that uh, this uh, president uh, believes that uh, he has this kind of authority, which I do not. So anyway, thanks for the call. Let's go, uh, let's go to uh, Fallon. Let's go to Fallon and talk to Joyce. Joyce? Hello? Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. Who's this? This is McDonald Dagner. Okay. What I have to ask is... Uh, uh, you're doing a lot, a lot of good there, but I'd like to see a bill so that these people that get out of prison can understand that they have no right to trespass on other people's lands. And they're doing a lot here in Fallon about that. The, our local authority is fine, but we've got problems with people doing this as they please. And they're, they're abusing seniors. Okay. Hello? Okay. I'll tell you what, I'm not familiar with this issue. Um, but I do appreciate you bringing it to my attention. Why don't we do this? Since uh, you're interested in legislation on this, call my office. Call my office uh, there in Reno at 
5770. Let's talk more about this. I just need to get a little bit more background and information. I'd hate to uh, uh, jump out in front of something that uh, there's more that I can learn from. So please call us. Please call us, 686-5770, and we'll have a, a deeper discussion. I want, to go back, uh, I want to go back to my survey question one more time. I think we have about as many people as we're going to get on the line uh, now. It does take a while, obviously, to get everybody on the phone. But I've been asking this survey question throughout the evening, uh, specifically about the economy. It's probably the issue. The issue. If you go to any poll, any poll that's uh, run nationally, the number one issue, uh, one, two, and three, will always be jobs, the economy, and health care. Three top issues. Uh, so today the survey is about the economy. I want as many people participating as possible. And I will tell you the results at the end of the hour so that you know how uh, how this went. But uh, the question, of course, is... Um, talks about how the uh, president, the president uh, is saying that the economy is improving and yet we have 20 million Americans that are currently um, unemployed or underemployed, uh, which means real unemployment here in this country is somewhere around 12%. Worse here in Nevada, um, 8% unemployment, which is one of the highest in the nation, real unemployment probably closer to 15%. So the question for the evening is, do you feel like the economy is turning around? On your phone, on the keypad, press one for yes, two for no, and three if you're undecided. Do you feel like the economy is turning around? One for yes, two for no, and three if you're undecided. And this will be the last time I ask this survey question this evening, but I certainly do appreciate everybody who has participated, and quite a few of you did. I will share the results of that uh, survey with you um, at, uh, at the close uh, this evening. So let's go to a few more. We, we still have time for a few more. I want to go out to Wells. Let's go out to Wells. I had a bunch of students here um, um, with, uh, uh, with the utility company, uh, students that uh, came out here to Washington, D.C. Several of them were from Wells. Let's talk to John. John out there in Wells. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name's Rose. It's not John, but it's okay. Sorry, Rose. <laughs> and um, am I not mistaken on these two-thirds votes on the thing that the president is vetoing all the time? Can't two-thirds votes override his veto? Yeah, that's accurate, Rose. It does take two-thirds to overcome the uh, overcome a veto. So then, coming coming um, on this uh, coming up election, if we take the Senate, isn't that possible of getting it? Um. I doubt that we, right now, right now, the makeup of the United States Senate is 55-45. Uh, more Democrats, obviously, than Republicans. If we pick up six more seats, and there's probably only about 14 in play, if we pick up six more seats out of the 14, we'll be uh, back in the uh, majority. That will be far short of the two-thirds that are necessary. Now, if we can get reasonable uh, uh, people on the other side of the aisle to agree with us, certainly, certainly, that's the way it works. Uh, we could overcome any veto uh, from the president. Very, very difficult to achieve, and frankly, I think our founding fathers set it up that way so that it would be difficult, but you are right. It is accurate. It does take two-thirds vote to override a veto. Then why does everybody keep saying that there's not a damn thing that that has to be that's messing with that we can do about it? <laughs> that's what I don't understand. <laughs> there is something we could do about it. We all stuck together to do it. I agree. I agree. If we, uh, as, uh, as frankly, as members of Congress, not as Republicans, not as Democrats, but as members of Congress, if we stick together, we can get some things done. And that's big, been the problem out here. It's been way too partisan. I've worked together with, uh, with both sides of the aisle trying to get uh, legislation passed. I worked on the unemployment uh, insurance extension uh, with Jack Reed from Rhode Island. I uh, am part of several groups that try to bring Republicans and Democrats together, hoping to be able to solve some problems so that we can move this country forward. Partisanship's gotten way out of hand, way out of hand. It's time for that to change. And I'm hoping, what I'm hoping is that this election will send that message. Anyway, thank you very much, Rose, for the call. Thanks for taking time. I want to go out to Beatty. Let's talk to Kevin out in Beatty. Hello, can you hear me? I can, Kevin. Oh, hi. Well, thanks for taking this call. I, I would just like to, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, you have been stating all along here, and you have for years, that you support large-scale renewable energy, but you're not talking about a lot of the problems associated with that. 
true Nevada is 87% federally owned, but throughout that 87% are a lot of towns, there's a lot of little communities. And when one of these communities is faced with a large wind project, for example, they're looking at like an excess of 20,000 acres. They'll bring in a bunch of construction workers, and that creates jobs for them. They usually come from somewhere else. But this wind farm will only create about 10 full-time jobs. Um, the power produced is questionable. The megawatts are on a capacity factor, meaning what the developer says usually isn't the energy that's produced. And if these the projects are built next to a small town, well, like the one proposed for Searchlight Nevada, that tourism economy, that beautiful scenery around there is going to go away, and you're going to trade a sustainable tourist economy for 10 full-time jobs. And these wind farms, they destroy wildlife. They're not green. They kill a lot of birds. So I'd like you guys to think about that. Before you're going to cover Nevada with renewable energy, think about the economic tourism aspects that the scenery has and try to concentrate that energy more where it works at people's homes. That's what solar energy is for. It's not going to solve the energy crisis, but plastering all of our open space with renewable energy is going to hurt our economy in a tourism way. Thank you. All right, all right. Point taken, point taken. Um, I will um, respond uh, with a brief, uh, something that is brief. We only have one, we only have one wind in energy project in the state of Nevada right now. Nevada's not big with wind. Uh, not to say that it isn't windy, but it's either blowing too hard or not hard enough. Um, the efficiency of wind energy uh, in most of the state is less than 15%, meaning that it's not blowing at the, the uh, necessary uh, velocity, uh, velocity in order to uh, uh, to, uh, to to turn the uh, turn the wheels. So, uh, what we do more of is geothermal. Uh, we do more geothermal. We do more of uh, uh, of sunlight and uh, and get uh, and work in that direction. So, um, anyway, we'll probably be more of a solar, more of a geothermal state, less wind. But um, you've made your point. Uh, geothermal is a little bit different. Very small footprint. Um, and then, uh, obviously, with the uh, with the solar projects uh, that we have around the state, um, we're able to create uh, um, energy that way. But don't anticipate to see a lot of windmills uh, in the state of Nevada, simply because um, as a mount, we are one of, we are the most mountainous state in the lower 48, and uh, so it's very very difficult for that to work. So anyway, I think. Uh, I think we can uh, help uh, uh, facilitate economic growth and development, um, but and also at the same time we have to keep an eye on the uh, pristine areas that we have throughout the state and the, the, the visuals that are available. I want to thank you very much for that question. Uh, thanks for taking time, Kevin, and uh, certainly appreciate uh, uh, you working with me on this. So here we go. Here we go. Well, I want to thank everybody this evening for joining. We're going to go to the last phone call. We're uh, at the end of our hour, uh, but I have a number of people in, this, in the queue that still want to ask questions. What I'm going to ask you to do is not hang up. And after I get to the last question, I'll put you to voicemail. We'll get to, uh, we'll get to your questions and comments uh, through voicemail. Uh, so please don't hang up. Leave your name, leave your telephone number, and either myself or someone from my staff will get back to you. So even if you didn't quite make uh, this uh, particular call, please don't hang up. And uh, I will get to everybody uh, that wants to ask a question. And again, if you still want to ask, hit zero on your keypad. Hit zero on your keypad, and that'll put you in the queue. That'll put you to voicemail as soon as I'm done. And uh, either myself or someone from my staff will get back to you um, in the next week or so. So let's go to the last caller. And what I'm going to do is take a look here and go to Jennifer. Let's go to Jennifer um, in Fallon. Jennifer, are you on the line? Well, this isn't Jennifer. This is Steve. Hi, Steve. You don't sound like a Jennifer. No, no, not hardly. <laughs> I've got three quick comments, and of course, okay. they're all huge issues, so I don't expect to get a complete dissertation on it. Uh, number one, Obamacare, how it worked for me and my wife, is when we sat down and figured it out with the local people that helped, it do, helped us do that here, we came up at 947 a month to have minimal care, so totally undoable for us. 
second thing, with my civics classes when I was young, I was taught that government was split into three groups, so no one group would have total power. Is nobody in Washington seen what Obama's doing? And the third thing, of course, is uh, if you need a spokesman, and I've emailed your office several times and got no response, uh, regarding VA and veterans' benefits, how they're working in northern Nevada or how they're not working, I would like to discuss that further with you on a one-on-one. Good, good. I'd like that, too. All right, Steve, we'll make sure that that phone call, we'll make sure that phone call happens. What I would like you to do is call my uh, office in Reno at 686-5770 and talk to Ashley. Talk to Ashley, 686-5770. She'll set up a time that you and I can talk about uh, these veteran services. As most on the line know that I have uh, been pushing hard, pushing very hard to try to reduce the backlog problem that we have here in the state of Nevada. Our regional office is one of the worst in the country. When it comes to a backlog, some people wait three or four years to get the benefits and the health care that they deserve. I'm going to continue to work on that. So please, uh, please uh, um, let's make sure that that phone call happens, and I'm going to continue to advocate for that. Um, you asked about the three, uh, three uh, forms of government. Uh, we have the executive branch, uh, the judicial branch, and uh, the congressional branch. And uh, obviously, they all have three distinct purposes. And unfortunately, those are very gray areas now. We need to get a president back, uh, I think, uh, here that understands that. Uh, we need to get some, uh, uh, so, some members of Congress that understand that. But right now, it's a very gray area and, frankly, quite disappointing to me. Administration, even the Supreme Court, even the Supreme Court has been legislating quite a bit lately, and, uh, and it's wrong. So uh, uh, your, your point's well made there. Obamacare was the, was the uh, first question that you brought up. As, uh, as you know, uh, we were told a lot of things. If you want to keep your doctor, you can. That wasn't true. They told you that if, you, uh, if Obamacare passed, your, your health care costs would go down for the average family. $2,500 a year would decrease costs. Now we're finding out on average, the average middle class family is paying $2,500 a year more for their health care and getting um, less services. It's a shame that, uh, that we are where we are today, um, but uh, there's a lot of us back here and hoping that things change in this next election so that we can make the necessary change to improve that particular law. Hey, Steve, thanks for the call. I want to thank everybody who participated this evening. Um, I, I think it was a wonderful discussion, an opportunity to really talk about things that are important to you. I'm going to continue to do this. You'll hear back from me maybe uh, three or, uh, two or three months from now as I go around the state and do these tele-town hall meetings. I learn a lot. Let me give you the, uh, the uh, you know, results of that survey we did um, on the economy. The um, question was, do you feel like the economy is turning around? Uh, yes. 12% of you said yes. 12% said yes, 80% said no, and 8% were undecided. That was the numbers today, 12% yes, 80% said no, they do not feel like the economy is turning around, and 8% said they're undecided. So anyway, there's quite a message in that. Let me assure you, there is quite a message in that. So thank you for everyone for participating. Thank you for being with me this evening. Please be safe, and I will talk to you again in a couple of months. Good night.